I read this section at least 60 times within the last 24 hours today. And my heart is simply enraptured, it's thrilled, it's dynamically excited with it. It's almost totally contrary to everything the world believes. I should say not almost totally, but I'd say totally contrary to what the world believes, to what you were taught in the senses world. And being in this section of Romans, kids, just one of the greatest things you could ever share with people. In the last session, I took the core through verse 4. Tonight, of course, we begin with verse 5. Having spoken of the righteousness of the law fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, and by the way, the word flesh here is a figure of speech. The figure is called synecdoche, spelled S-Y-N-E-C-D-O-C-H-E, where a part is put for the whole. The difference between the figure metonymy and synecdoche is that in metonymy you deal with nouns. In synecdoche you deal with ideas, different associated ideas, where ideas of a part are put for a whole is synecdoche. Like the Word of God talks about Jesus Christ shedding his blood, shedding his blood for the remission of sins and so forth. It again is synecdoche. It's an idea where the blood, where the blood represents a lot more than just word blood. It's the idea behind it. Understand? The word flesh, as it appears here in Romans, is that figure all the way through. In verse 5, you have the word for starting out the verse. See it? Having closed the great fourth verse with the righteousness or the living of the, of the right ordinances, right requirements of the law fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But, see the word but? They that are after the spirit of the thing, things of the spirit. Verse 6. For to be carnally minded is at death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And then comes the word because. The carnal mind is enmity. For it is not subject to the law of God. Verse 8. So then is the word but. It's the Greek word Day, D E. Verse 9, but you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Verse 9, now is the word but. Verse 10, but if Christ be in you, then the word because of sin, body is dead because of sin in verse 10, but the spirit of life. Because, four tremendous words in there. Remember, 11. But, verse 12. Therefore, verse 13. For, but if ye, through the Spirit. Verse 14. For, as many as are led. Verse 15, for ye have not received, but ye have received the spirit of adoption. The Greek word for for is gar, G-A-R, Greek word. And this is put together from two Greek words. The word gay, G-E, meaning verily, and ara, A-R-A, meaning further, F-U-R, not F-A-R. Literally, the truth is, verse 5 then could read, the truth is, they that are after the flesh do what? 
mind the things of the flesh. Did you see that? I said it's made up of two words. The first one meaning verily, and the ara meaning further. The truth is, for, gives the reason why, the reason why, the cause, the motive involved, the cause of, the motive involved, the principles indicated are a statement or declaration of that which is truth. And in verse 5, you have the word, the word for and the word but. The word but is the word day, spelled D-E in the Greek, which sets in contrast that which precedes with that which follows. Many times in opposition of or with. There's only one stronger word that's translated but, and it's in this section in Romans, and that is the word Allah, A-L-L-A, and that's the most emphatic but it's possible to have in, a, in the language. Allah, A-L-L-A, is the most emphatic but, B-U-T, that you can have in the language. Perhaps if I gave you these logically and systematically, then when I get to the putting them all together for you in these verses 5 through 15, you'll be able to work it later so that you fully understand it. Gar or for is a statement or a declaration or an explanation of what is truth. Day is the word but. I gave you that also. Now the word because. Verse 7. First word because is the Greek word diot. D-I-O-T-I. Meaning on this account. Wherefore. Because of this reason. And core the fine lines of demarcation is what makes it possible so many times to understand the in-depth spiritual perception and awareness of that word and to have that. In verse 12, therefore, ara, A-R-A, un, O-U-N, which means still further, logically beyond, It's proceeding naturally from the preceding. It's naturally following from the preceding. It proceeds and moves on naturally from that which is given as truth precedingly. It is there, T-H-E-R-E, -E, for. F O R. It is there for naturally. The word ara, of which the word therefore is made up, A R A, and un, O U N, literally means harmony. Ara is harmony. Un is logical. Verse 12. Logically harmonious, brethren, or if you like it the other way, harmoniously logical, brethren, basically implies the same truth as the word symphonize in English. If two of you agree regarding prayer, if two of you symphonize, it's a fantastic usage of a word. Because in a symphony, all the instruments have to be properly tuned. Every note has to be 
synchromeshed with every instrument, all fit together. That's why it's the word symphonize. Harmonize. Whenever something symphonizes, it's pleasant to the ears. It's enjoyable to the sight in the senses realm. That is the greatness of Arahud, translated therefore. Meaning still further, logically beyond, naturally following from the preceding. In verse 5, the word for, the first word is the word gar. The word but, in verse 5 is the word day, D-E. In verse 6, the word for is gar. The word but is day, D-E. In verse 7, the word because is dioti, D-I-O-T-I. The word for is the word gar. I'm in verse 7. Neither indeed, the word indeed is the word gar, G-A-R. Verse 8. So then is the word day, D-E. In verse 9, but is day. The second but, but you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit is the word Allah, A-L-L-A. -L -L -A. And as I told you, that's the strongest usage of the contrast, but. The word now in verse 9 is the word day. Verse 10, the word and is the word day. Because, because is the word D, D -E I, or Dia, D I A, meaning on account of. The word but is the word day, and the word because, the last word because of righteousness, is again Dia. Authorized version, the Greek text behind it, uses for the first because the word. D-I, but the last one they have D-I-D-I-A, and I believe Tregellus and other men used D-I for the first one, and I believe D-I-A should be the because, the first because, as well as the last one in verse 10. In verse 11, the first word is day, D-E. What's the word by in that verse? By his spirit that dwelleth in you. Okay. That is the word dia, which we will work tonight showing you that it, it should be translated on account of the definition which I've already given you. In verse 12, therefore, araun, A-R-A-O-U-N, 13, 4 is the word gar, but is the word day. That's 13. Then in verse 14, the word for is the word gar, G-A-R. And then in verse 15, the word for is the word G-A-R, gar. The word but is the word Allah, A-L-L-A. -L -L -A. Strongest most emphatic word for but you can have. I don't know what that does to your heart, but I know it does to mine. They just hit you in the head like that, just like that, one right after the other. And then in verse 16, they're totally discontinued for a little bit, and it goes into some other type of truth which sort of summarizes and continues to build the greatness of this fantastic section 
of the book of Romans. No man living who loves God, who loves the word, and who has even a small knowledge of the usage of words could not stand but in utter amazement of the greatness of the revelation that appears in these tremendous verses of Scripture from Romans 8. In here we have the truth of God's word regarding born-again believers, sons of God, and that my present knowledge and understanding of people's lives among the believers, I doubt if over 2% ever really believe the truth of God's word and live it. Verse 5, for they that are after the what? Flesh. Do mind. Do mind. Literally obey. Because you cannot obey anything except what you've been taught or what you believe. And if you get your information via the five senses, and that's the word flesh, remember the figure synecdoche, where a part stands for the whole, an associated idea, for they that are after the flesh. If you're born again of God's spirit, your body, soul, and what? Has it affected your mind? Therefore, you, you are still controlling your life by your what? Mind. And being body and soul, could you continue to go by the information you gathered by way of the five senses? Definitely. That's the flesh. Or after you're born again, you by your mind can believe God's word, renew your mind. That's why this section is continuing on the renewed mind. Then you could go by the spirit. That's exactly what that verse says. After you're born again, they that are after the flesh, who continue to live by the information they gather by way of their five senses, they're going to mind, they're going to obey, they're going to carry out the things of the what? You can't go beyond that, people. Understand? I taught you that a long time ago. You can't believe any bigger than what you're taught and all teaching comes to the human mind by way of one of the five senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, or touching, or by direct revelation, which would be spirit. And if it came to the human mind via the spirit, it will be of one or the other categories, even the true God or the adversary. Both sources of spiritual information are in extent. They that are after the flesh who get their information via the five senses, even if they're born again, they're going to mind, be obedient to the things of what? The flesh. The word do mind is the word phroneo, P-H-R-O-N-E-O, which means do mind. Literally, set your heart's desire on to set your heart's desire on the things of the flesh. I think the heart's desire is the best I know if you understand the word heart. In the essence of what I understand it to mean, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in thine what? That's what I mean about it. With, with every ounce of your being, your whole life is geared toward this. If you're after the flesh, you do mind the things of what? You care for. Your heart's desire is for, God, I have to have a new automobile. I got to have TV. I got to have all the furniture. I got to have this. I got to have that. I got to have that. got to have that. That is what this word is talking But in contrast, but in contrast, verse 5, they that are after, the spirit, after is like the word according to. The spirit, 
And then there is a figure of speech of omission. Do mind should be inserted here. Did thereafter the flesh do mind what? Of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit do what? Mind what? There you got it, just like that. And you're going to walk in one or the other category or combination. Most of us walk in combination. Half time, we're, or 80% of the time, we mind the things of the flesh and the other 20% things of the spirit, or proportionately. To the end that you mind the things of the flesh, you're still walking after you're born again by what? To the end you mind the things of the Spirit, you're walking according to what? So there are two ways to walk after you're born again. By the flesh or by what? That's what that verse says. And both the mind of the flesh as well as the mind of the Spirit are controlled by the free will of the man. To either walk by the mind of what? The flesh, or to walk by what? You make up your mind. By the freedom of your will, you are in control of which way you walk. To walk by the Spirit, once more, Cor, is to walk by the revealed Word of God. Rightly divided, revealed Word of God, the Word or to walk by revelation. First of all, the Bible, the Word of God, is what? Revelation. Therefore, the revelation known as the manifestation of the Spirit, Word of Knowledge and Word of Wisdom, is beyond or in addition to what the revelation of the Word gives, and it's only, sir, regarding a specific incident. There's only two ways you can walk by the Spirit. No other way. So when you walk by the Word of God, you're walking via the Spirit. If you're walking by that revelation regarding a specific incident, then you're still walking how? That's why you need the manifestation of Word of Knowledge and Word of Wisdom. Verse 6. For to be carnally minded, and to be carnally minded is to be flesh minded, census minded, to continue to carry in your mind after you're born again the information which you gather via the five senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, or touching. And if you continue that way after you're born again, for to be carnally minded is what? Death. But in contrast, if you by the freedom of your will after you're born again desire to be spiritually minded, that is life and what? The word is is in italics. But here again you have the figure of omission. The word is, is properly supplied if you understand the word is as the result is. To be carnally minded is what? Death. But to be spiritually minded, the result is what? Life and what? Right. Literally meaning a peaceful life. Life and peace is a peaceful life. To be spiritually minded, the result is a peaceful life. Boy, oh boy, what a fantastic word of God. Now, the word because. On this account, wherefore, because of this reason, the carnal mind. On this account, the carnal mind is 
The result is, again omission, carnal mind, enmity against who? God. Enmity means to be at loggerheads. And how we have tried with our carnal minds through the years to make ourselves acceptable. Hardly any man believes this because you succumb to names, to degrees, to social positions rather than the truth of God's word. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't care who would be seated in this auditorium tonight. I've come to the place that in my life the word of God is the will of God and man has no influence regarding my life as to the change in my teaching. I teach the same thing. If the governor of the state was here tonight, if the president of the United States was here tonight, I'd still teach the same thing. Because, sir, no sense knowledge man, no position, no man in authority, sense his world, carries any weight comparison to the greatness of God's word because everything he stands for unless he renews his mind and lives God's word is enmity against who? That's what the word says and that is where I stand because that's where the word stands. And if it's wrong, I go down with the ship, John Paul Jones. That's right, people. The carnal mind, therefore the most brilliant mind to that men salam and they, ooh, they pay anything for. The Bible says is what against God. That's why usually what you'll see in the most highly intellectual circles is a rejection of the true God. They'll call themselves agnostics, atheists, and everything. Well, the Bible's already told me. I ain't stupid, I just believe the word. It's enmity against what? That's why I'm not impressed with people. I am impressed with the truth of God's word. And people who live that word impress me. But it's the word. And here in Romans, sits this thing like a diamond, and it's so simple. I was thinking today, one verse of scripture, no problem in my mind, the words already told me. The love of money is the root of all what? God, you keep looking wherever you want to. I quit looking. I got one verse of scripture, settles the whole thing. So if you want to be in confusion by the enmity against God with the sharpness of your stupidity, go ahead, it's your privilege. I just believe the simplicity of the word and have a peaceful life. The love of money is the root of what? So whenever you see evil, I just take a look. Already know the answer. It's always there. Never fails. And money, again, is figure of speech. What it can buy. You know, if it was stones, same principle. The love of stones is the root of all evil if we were trading stones for food. The carnal mind is what? Maybe the reason I can teach this so well is because I've been at all these locations. I used to just shiver and shake and get nervous when I had to appear before a professor who was a PhD and I was just a little old peon. Well, I've changed my mind. You ought to change yours according to word. The carnal mind no matter how sharp it looks to you. We call them think tanks. They're skink tanks in God's sight. They just got the misnomer. Every time that carnal mind moves, it's always destructive. It will use everything it develops to ultimately destroy the very thing they tell you that they're trying to establish. And that's enmity against who? Amen. It's what the word says. 
you don't believe it, it's okay with me. But there's a day coming you'll stand before God do. If I were you, I'd make up my mind. Because that day we appear before God, rewards are handed out. So if you just don't want to sit in the kitchen, you want to get around the living room, I'd lay up a few. Why? Verse 7 says, for, for, it is not subject, the carnal mind is not subject Literally, not in subjection to. It puts itself above the law of what? Sounds like Genesis, doesn't it? God said, thou shalt not. Adam and Eve said, oh, maybe he's obeyed. It's not in subjection to the law of God. There is nothing acceptable to God in the flesh. Be it body, I run the hundred in eight six, or the mind, nothing acceptable to God in the flesh. Be it body or mind. It's all what? Enmity. Why? Because the flesh is dominated by the law of sin and death. It is a law. The spirit, on the other hand, is dominated by the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For it is not subject to the law of what? God, neither. Absolutely, it cannot be. Why? Because it doesn't get its information from the truth of God or his word. It gets its information via the five what? And who controls and owns the kingdoms of God? this world the adversary is not subject in subjection to the law of God neither can be it cannot be it cannot be subject to God because it does not get its information from God verse 8 but they that are in the flesh I can understand the translation, so then. Neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot, cannot. And you know what the word cannot means? What means? Please who? So ladies and gentlemen, it is not how do you count your beads. Whether you face east, west, north, or south when you pray. Not whether you bring your offering in a beautiful silver tray or in a horn of plenty. It has nothing to do with loving and serving God. Because nothing in the flesh pleases what? You cannot please. It isn't that God doesn't enjoy our being here tonight, nicely dressed, all that stuff, beautiful American beauty rose on here, great yellow Kleenex. <laughs> but if none of this was here, if I had to sit here tonight in clothing that would not be casually elegant, it would still be the truth of what? God's word. Nothing in the flesh will please who? And ladies and gentlemen, how that strikes all of us right between the eyes. How many, many, many times we have thought we could please God by something we did in the flesh. 
Go to Sunday school. Go to church. Go to prayer meeting. Go here. Go there. Build a hospital. Give my money. Nothing in the flesh can ever please who? Why you try? Quit trying. Nothing wrong with the flesh, except it's got to live under a greater law. But whenever people think they can, you know, they think you've got to be water baptized. Well, water is flesh category. Shoot, you can drink the stupid stuff. So if you got immersed once, it couldn't please God. So one group teaches one is enough. Another group teaches you've got to be immersed three times. And they fight among each other. Stupidity. All fight among so-called born-again believers is always over works. Census category. I've never seen it fail. First Church of the Navalites. <laughs> Perhaps, again, the reason I know all this so well because I worked so hard to be so good. I just I get chills running up and down my spine when I think about it. I've been baptized every which way by water that's in the book and outside of the book and all tradition. So I get water baptized, one sunder, up and out. Then I get with another group and they said, the reason you haven't got the fullness of the Holy Spirit is because you didn't do it right. And I said, well, how do you do it right? And they said, three times. Once in the name of God, up. Once in the name of his son, up. Once in the name of the Holy Spirit, up. I went up and down three times, under, completely under. Because they said, my sprinkling when I was an infant wasn't good enough. But before I went under all the way, I'd gone the other way of dipping too, which is Anglican, Episcopal. Then I went through all the other confusion. And one of the great, greatest days as I looked back upon it, and I was back in Buffalo, New York, where I was in a meeting where they baptized by what I call dry cleaning. I sat in a group on the left-hand side of the auditorium about seven rows back, about, honey, where you're sitting back there, and I believed I was being baptized. You can't go beyond where you want. And I was hungry for the things of God. I wanted to please God. I wanted to do that which was right in his sight. With all my heart, so my. But I can't go beyond what I'm taught. God, if somebody had only taught me what I'm teaching the core today, it has saved me 15 years of condemnation frustration, fear, feel like a damn fool a thousand times or more, unworthy of everything. They'd only taught me, they that are in the flesh cannot what? Please God. I tried so hard. Some of you tried too. <laughs> Wasn't that miserable? The harder I tried, the further I slipped down the ladder. Like a grease pig, I dropped off of it all the time. See, I'd worked so hard to be so good, and then I was so lousy, blew it. <laughs> Maybe there's a psychological law to it, doctor. The law of reversed effort, maybe, huh? <laughs> See, boy, people, when are we going to believe the word? I'm not saying you're saying anything wrong with the place, but I'm simply saying. If you're in the flesh, you're living by the information of the senses of five categories of flesh, you cannot want. There's only one way to please God, and that's by believing his word. And honey, it doesn't make any difference in God's sight whether you've got that long dress on or if you were decently in order with bikinis, if that's decent and in order. Doesn't make God one bit of difference whether we have two lights on this teaching table or one, 
whether we have the American Beauty Rose or the Kleenex or my cup of coffee or the ice tray or the pen or the books, the Greek text interlinear, doesn't make one God but Honey, what you got in your heart? Who do you worship in spirit and in truth? Where do you stand? That's what he's talking about. Where is the heart of the man or the woman? For God doesn't look on the outside of a man or a woman. He looks on what? The heart, the motive, the motive, the desire, the longing in your soul, honey. That's God. They that are in the flesh cannot what? But, verse 9, you're not in the flesh. But you are not in the flesh in contrast. But in the what? Right, and that word but is the word Allah. That's the hardest, the most profound, the most emphatic usage of the word but in contrast. When you're born again of God's spirit, and you renew your mind, put on the mind of Christ, then you don't go by the information of the senses. You don't endeavor to please God with the carnal mind. But, but! <laughs> That's emphatic. Is the what? Right. There's no article D, it's just in spirit or by way of the Spirit. If so be that Spirit of God dwell in you. To the end we renew our minds after we're born again with Christ in us, the hope of glory, with the Spirit of God indwelling us. To that end we manifest the greatness of the love of God in the renewed mind. You're not in the flesh, but Allah, in spirit, if so be, that spirit of God dwelleth or indwelleth you. But, the word now is the word but, if any man have not spirit of Christ in, he is not his is the text. None of his. He is not his. He is not God's because he does not have the spirit of who? He is what? Sense knowledge wise, could he be a great man? Sharp as a meatball. Right. Tremendously impressive. Socially acceptable. Blue blood register. Yet the word of God says, he is none of his. He is not his. Does that mean I hate that person? Does that mean I raise hell with them? No, I witness to them. And if they will to believe, they may. If they don't, they just have to go the way of all flesh, Samuel Butler. Because every man or woman has a right, by the freedom of their will, to make up their mind which way they will go. Remember the Oxenham poem, wasn't it? To every man that openeth a way and ways and a way. And the high soul climbs the highway, the low soul gropes the low. And in between on the misty flat, the rest drift to and fro. But to every man there openeth a highway and a low, and every man decideth which way his soul shall go. My Bible says that if any man, any one is the text, have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He is not his. And there's only one way whereby man must be saved, and that's at the name of Jesus Christ. They may be wonderful people, may be great people, great philosophers, history, mathematicians, religious people, theologians. Wonderful. But they are none of what? 
maybe good people, morally wonderful, but they still are none of his. And there's a lot more to this life than just this life. There is eternal life. Verse 10. The first word is the word but. But if Christ in you, the body indeed dead, the word is is the word indeed, the body indeed dead, dia, on account of sin. That's why, class, every man will die physically unless the Lord returns and interrupts the procedure. But, in contrast, the spirit life, the spirit indeed life, body indeed death, but the spirit in you is indeed what? Life. Why? Because on account of his righteousness, which is God's righteousness in Christ in you. For God was in Christ, and when you're born again, it's in you. Perhaps I should have given you a literal according to in verse 6. For the mind of the flesh is death, but mind of the spirit is life with peace, or peaceful life. And here in verse 10, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit, parentheses, new birth in you is life because of his right. Verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from among the dead or out from among the dead, and that's God who raised him up, dwell in you or indwelleth you. And when you're born again of God's spirit, he indwelleth. See, sin indwells. Romans 7, heck, you remember that said that someplace. It says it in verse 17. 717. No more I that do, but sin that dwelleth in what? See, sin indwelleth in the natural man, a body and soul. When you're born again, spirit indwelleth. Then by the your controlling of your mind, according to Revelation word, you Determine which one rules in your life. Whether the old man of sin rules or the new man of Christ in you, which is the spirit, rules. With the indwelling in you, he that raised up, and the text, in some of the texts reads Jesus Christ, not just Christ, but raised up Jesus Christ out from among the dead shall quicken. The word quicken is to make alive. And in all of its depth, it means here, make his home with, in residence. Raised up Jesus Christ from the dead shall make his home. He's going to make his home in your mortal what? And that's that beautiful carcass sitting out there. That's your mortal body. When you're born again with Christ in you, he makes himself at home. He indwelleth you. It's Christ in you. When you confessed with your mouth, he came in. Christ in you. And he quickens, makes alive, your mortal what? Very few people believe that. He doesn't do it automatically. It comes in a manifestation when you buy your what? Mind, control it and believe it. The greatest healing I know is the new birth. 
And I know a lot of people who are born again of God's spirit, sicker than dogs. Can't be God. The Bible says he quickens, doesn't kill. He quickens, he does what? Makes alive because he's at home within you. You're mortal what? That will include your eyesight, your foot sight, your whole body. He will electrify you within spiritually. Fantastic. But it doesn't occur until people do one thing, believe. Because the mind of believing controls the potential and the greatness of the outreach of the spirit within. Because it is exousia. And energimata, exercising the energy of the Christ within you. And that quickens your mortal what? It's how God heals you. Do you know something? In the great accuracy of what I believe the word teaches, whenever a man gets born again, he should be totally delivered physically. The potential is latent. For it's Christ where the hope of what? And he quickens what? Old things are what? All things become what? But see, nobody's ever taught us, so we have no believing for it. God, if the church ever begins to see what, I, what this word really says, the days of Acts will be repeated all over. Peter's shadow, people got healed. And honey, there's no healing in the, sh in the shadow. <laughs> the healing is in believing because it's Christ in you the hope of glory and they knew that Christ was in Peter he manifested it and when he walked by they believed that just the presence of that man of God his shadow they believed they would be healed be it unto you according to your what believing. Quicken your what? Quicken your mortal bodies also. You see the word also appears after the word shall in King James. Shall also quicken. No, 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 no. You ought to get yourself the book out of the library entitled also. You ought to mark every place in your Bible where the word also should appear. In the Greek text, it's very easy because there you can see it very plainly because in the Greek text, the word also is immediately before the word employed. That is to be emphasized. In other words, the Greek word is immediately before the word that's employed there, which is to be emphasized. In English usage, however, in all the translations I've seen, it's either before or after the word, and it doesn't make any sense. In the way ministry, in our research, teaching, and writing, put the word also after the word it emphasizes in our English. In Greek, as I told you, it immediately precedes the word emphasize, but in translation, we put it immediately afterwards because we're English, not Greek. And here it reads, quicken your mortal bodies also. It's just not Christ indwelling in you, but quickening. It's not people, it's not only spiritual, but it's physical, don't you see it? God, that spirit of Christ in you when you believe, does something inside of your body, makes you the greatest man physically you've ever been, the greatest woman you've ever been. It makes what I call a man a man and a woman a woman. And I call it men of God and women of God. That's what it makes you. The most beautiful women the world has ever seen. The most handsome men the world has ever seen. For it's Christ in you, people. That's Romans. That's the word of God. And he does this in your mortal bodies also, not just spiritually, but in your mortal bodies. That's why it's healing to your bones or something. 
by his spirit that indwelleth you. Now here we get in verse 12 to the word therefore. As I said still further, logically beyond, naturally following from the preceding, therefore, brethren, we are in debt. Debtors. We are in debt. But we're not in debt to the adversary or the kingdoms of the world. We are indebted to the one who saved us, who brought us from death unto life, who set us upon our high places, who indwells us and quickens our what? That's the one we're indebted to. And that's where we'll go the next session.